back, everybody. Um, the first speaker in this session is Austin Fowler. He's going to uh, tell us about some aspects about the surface code that are maybe sometimes swept under the rug. It's about the classical uh, processing of the syndrome information. Austin, please. Thanks for the introduction. I'd also like to thank the organizers very much for the opportunity to speak here. So yeah, as Martin mentioned, I'd like to talk about uh, the real deal. So when you come to doing surface code quantum error correction, what does your classical computer actually need to do without sweeping under the rug anything that can actually be dealt with pos uh, properly? I might move this down a bit. I think we're feedback. Let's see if that's a bit better. All right. So at the moment, there are a couple of candidates for an efficient algorithm to do this. There's a renormalization group algorithm, which we'll hear about on Friday. Um, and then there's the minimum weight perfect matching algorithm, which is the topic of this talk. I prefer the latter simply because at the moment it's the only one that's been demonstrated to work in the fault torrent setting. So with that in mind, the problem of correcting the errors that get generated in the service code looks like the following. You get a graph. Each one of these vertices represents the end point of an error chain. And you have to take that graph, which has boundaries, and find a pairing of vertices to either boundaries or other vertices that uses the, the minimum amount of string. So this represents, if you like, the minimum number of errors required to reproduce the observed error information, the detection events. And it could be reasonably expected that if you find the minimum number of errors that reproduces the observed information, that that would also be a pretty good guess at the corrections. And all of those qualifications are there. So technically, this method has not even to work, right? At least at a formal level, there's no known threshold for this. All of the work that's done is numerical. So that caveat aside, Numerically, it works spectacularly well. So to overview, we're first going to motivate why studying the surface code. I'm a big fan of the surface code, so you'll certainly get a flavor of that throughout the talk. Describe what it is, all of its neat little features, and then we'll get right into the guts of the classical processing, why it's hard, and even what open problems remain. There are still some very challenging open problems that remain. Right now, today, if someone said, here's a, a billion cubic quantum computer, please go and correct all the errors using the surface code, the answer would be we have no idea how to do that. So we'll talk about why that is and what we can do about it. So the big claim, I guess, for this talk is twofold. Firstly, that we can parallelize this problem and solve it in order one. And secondly, that we can do it in an absolute sense very quickly. So we have a three second implementation that fault torrently solves the distance 1,000 case. That's 4 million qubits. So every round of error correction on a PC takes three seconds. So why, why the surface code? What's so great about the surface code? Well, firstly, there is, to the best of my knowledge, no known concrete architecture that implements the abstract every qubit can interact with every other qubit with no error penalty, no time penalty, and full parallelism. And I'd be very happy to hear if anyone disagrees with that and can give a concrete architecture in which that's possible. By contrast, there are many concrete proposals for how to do 2D nearest neighbor. So it's a very practical way of thinking about qubits and what we might actually be able to one day build. So there's a, a list of these guys, which you can read through. But the, the take home message is that it's achievable to do that, whereas it may not be achievable to do this arbitrary interactions. Following on from that, there's an awful lot of work that's been done on concatenated codes. That was the early days of quantum error correction. It's very well developed theory. But when you go and map these codes into 2D nearest neighbor, they just don't work very well. Uh, you end up with very non-local stabilizers that you need to measure. You end up with a lot of uh, swap gates. You end up with a lot of gate overhead. And this eats into your threshold error rate. So for the two mappings that I'm aware of that have been performed, Steen code and the Bacon Shaw code to 2D nearest neighbor, you end up with threshold error rates of approximately 2 by 10 to the minus 5. And that's still assuming that your memory errors are a tenth everything else. So it's a generous calculation, and it still obtains a spectacularly low threshold error rate. Secondly, when you do this mapping, you bump up the overhead quite enormously. So your 
qubit steam code becomes a 48 qubit tile. Again, current work. No one's saying you can't do better, but that's the current work. And this means that as you start concatenating up your distance 9 code, nearly 2,500, distance 27, 100,000, you know, and you get this scaling of the number of qubits with the distance. So it, your concatenated codes become very high overhead. By contrast, the surface code was motivated and designed for 2D nearest neighbor. It works optimally in 2D nearest neighbor. Long range interactions wouldn't really even help you very much with the surface code. That's what it's good for. So in this situation, you now get really nice thresholds that are very close to what can be done experimentally today. And indeed, this is well above uh, many individual gates in experimental implementations. It's actually quite low overhead, so it has a reputation of being high overhead. In fact, Robert Rausendorf himself mentioned that the surface code is high overhead, but I would really beg to differ. And for concrete reasons, well, let's have a look at this. If we want to compare apples with apples, here's 2D nearest neighbor. And I should also mention this threshold error rate does not assume memory errors are a tenth the size of other gate errors. They're full strength. So a distance 9 requires 880, so it's less than the concatenated code. Even better, the distance is very flexible. I can make my lattice just one notch bigger, and I get more protection. So I can use a distance 10 code, whereas if I need just a little bit more error correction for concatenation, I've got to use a whole new level. I've got to go up by a factor essentially of 50 qubits just for a little bit more. Here, I can go up by you know, 10% and get a little bit more. Even if we keep going and have a look at the complete scaling, we'll see that the surface code has, in an absolute sense, lower overhead than the concatenated steam code. So if we want to compare with other topological approaches, as it stands, as of today, the surface code has a threat rate that's a factor of 10 higher than any other known topological code. We also have the full set of Clifford groups worked out with low overhead. You can do all sorts of nice things we'll talk about in a sec in terms of CNOT gates and logical gates. So for me, this is enough to claim that at the moment, it's just simply the most promising and practical code we know. So why? Why in more detail? Firstly, to actually even get started with this code, again, people say, oh, you'll need hundreds of qubits to demonstrate anything. It's not true. Here are 13 qubits laid out 2D nearest neighbor. This would allow you to fault tolerantly nearest neighbor perform distance three quantum error correction. If you have an ion trap, and one thing I'd certainly like to talk to Rainer uh, Blatt about, then you don't need four check qubits. You only need one that moves around. So you would have 10 qubits and a full fault tolerant quantum error correction uh, demonstration. There's no other code that can do better than that. Qubit code could do equal to that, but it has a much, much lower threshold error rate. So this is actually the lowest overhead, highest threshold, most promising, experimentally realistic. First experiment will be done for full fault tolerance. Now, it's, it's not all that rosy. This is not very scalable. We recently uh, put online a scheme that is based on this, but uh, you have to put in a lot of extra qubits to couple these plates together. It is similar and um, more honest to look at the scalable case where a logical qubit actually takes 72 qubits to implement. Uh, you end up cutting pairs of holes. You have logical operators that stretch between these holes and around these holes. And this is a distance three scalable surface code logical qubit. You know, of course, we'd start here. So how does it work? We have this array of qubits. They're black and white. The white ones represent places where we store data. The black ones are places where we check for errors. So qubits and data qubits. And you perform these very simple little circuits to determine what errors you have nearby. So we want all of our data qubits to satisfy a few conditions, a few stabilized conditions. We want them to be in an eigenstate of these operators, z, 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 z around each face, x, 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 x around each vertex. And as been mentioned in previous talks, they all commute, so that it is possible to check where, which eigenstate of this guy we have. It's a simple circuit. In particular, if you have quantum non-demolition measurement, you only need five gates to give you one bit of information about the presence or absence of X errors. So those bits of information are very reliable. Same for the case of Z errors. So putting those circuits into this lattice, you can tile them such that you can measure every X and Z stabilizer in a sequence of five gates. 
So you get lots and lots of error information very quickly, very reliably. And that's why you have such a high threshold error rate. Single logical qubit gates. Firstly, there are a few easy ones, bit flips and phase flips in any error correction code you just implement in software. You just say, ah, I now have logical one. Which means if you go and measure it, you flip the result. Um, there are some more complicated ones, however. You want to do a Hadamard gate, well, you take your scalable qubit, cut it out of the lattice, then you do a transversal operation. A surface code is a CSS code, so that always works. You have to do a few technicalities. Um, you have to offset the qubits with a couple of swaps and a bunch of other stuff, but it's, it's efficient to do. Um, armed with an efficient Hadamard, you can perform a whole bunch of tricks. So for universality, you normally think in terms of these two states, distilling these two states. Uh, and then you go and use gate teleportation. So you use these chi of the rotations you want. But because we have an efficient Hadamard, you can create a Y state, so 0 plus I1, and affect an S gate without consuming that resource. So you get a cheap implementation of all of the single qubit Clifford group gates. And the CNOT gates are just fantastic. So let's have a look at what that means. So we have two types of logical qubits. You can either punch a pair of holes by punching out Z stabilizers or a pair of holes by punching out X stabilizers. And we call these smooth qubits and rough qubits just because of the way you tend to draw these black lines in the background which represent the faces and vertices, which represent Z and X stabilizers. So the way you cut it, you end up with these little hairs on the middle. So we call them a rough qubit and a smooth qubit. The nice feature of these, which I won't prove, but hopefully is intuitively believable, is if I go and move this hole around, moving a defect is a simple concept. If here's a hole and I want it to extend out to this location, I just turn off the error correction circuit in that location. I don't have to do anything physically exotic to move my defects, I just turn off the error correction. And I can do that in a great long line. If I want to move this defect to here in constant time, I just turn off all the error correction along that row. So that means I can get from here all the way to here in constant time. Right? This is not a sequential process. And by doing that, I drag and stretch the logical X operator around. Then I come back to where I started. And what that leaves is a line and a ring. So we've mapped our logical X to a product, a tensor product of logical X on both. That's one of the fundamental relations that defines what a C0 gate is. There are three others. They're fairly easy to show that they're true. If you imagine a Z operated between here and then you do this, it curls out, it curls around this, you end up with a chain and a ring of Z. That is this, op uh, this relationship. And then for the others, if you have, for example, a logical Z around this guy and then move it around, it just goes for a ride. It doesn't change. So that is this uh, operation, and the other one is similarly trivial to show. So this process implements C0. It's kind of neat. Um, it's a braiding operation, but it doesn't matter what direction you go around. You know, it's equally true that that's C0 and that is C0. And furthermore, you can do um, all kinds of really nice things in terms of, we'll see that on the next slide. Before I mention that though, you might be asking, hang on, you've got a smooth logical qubit and a rough logical qubit. That seems a bit restrictive, but it's not. So here's our smooth rough uh, braiding represented in space and time. So I hope you can match up this picture with this picture. We have our two defects. We move this guy around, we move this guy around, and then we move it back, and we move it back, and we, that's the braid in space and time. That's what it really looks like. And if we want to do the c not between two rough qubits, then you braid in this manner. This is effectively teleportation from a rough to a smooth, and then you perform the standard c not, which is here. That's that piece right there, and then you teleport it back. So you can do rough, rough, and smooth, smooth c not. There's no restriction there. But you can do heaps of more interesting things than that. So you can do a C0 gate between arbitrarily distant logical qubits in constant time. So we have a nearest neighbor protocol, a nearest neighbor code, but it allows non-local logical operations, which are the ones we really want. This means you can implement your algorithms very efficiently with only a modest space overhead. Even more than that, all right, so we have some classical information we need to propagate, which prevents um, Albert getting 
concerned with this. But, you know, we can actually bend them further than flat. We burn them back in time. So you can implement a chain of CNOT gates Then the circuit model is very commonly thought of as requiring time in constant time. So there's a general theorem that says you can take an arbitrary Clifford group circuit and implement it in constant time, e including in the, uh, in the circuit model. But here, perhaps, is just a graphical picture of why that's true in the topological model. And then you can imagine converting it back. So here we have C0, then Escape, then C0, then Hadamard taking time. But if this is a space-time braid, we have C0, and then we just bend the braids over. And then we do S, and then we braid them over, do a C0, bend them over, and do Hadamard. What this is really equivalent to is you prepare a Bell pair here, do the S-gate on one end of it. You pair a Bell basis measurement and so on. So this is bell pair, bell basis measurement, bell pair, bell basis measurement. It means you can do it in the circuit model as well. But it's a nice way to prove that theorem is true. So, surface code good, but as I said, we're not there yet if we wanted to implement it. And of course, there's the experimental side of the problem, actually building a 2D lattice of qubits with high enough fidelity. But there's also a significant classical processing challenge to that problem. So the first one is this guy, which we mentioned on the opening title page. So you have to correct errors fast enough. So a single round of surface code QEC can involve as few as five sequential quantum gates. We already said that, and that's a good thing. It's also a very challenging thing. That means you get an awful lot of data very quickly. You need to be able to keep up. So depending on the technology, this could take much less than a microsecond. Some of the superconducting qubits, some of the quantum dot technologies, particularly quantum dot technologies, run incredibly fast, sub-nanoseconds sometimes. And keeping pace with that vast stream of data from your array of qu uh, qubits, it's far from clear that you can even do it. We've pushed all of the hard work into the classical computer, and we assume classical computers are arbitrarily reliable and arbitrarily fast, but neither of those statements is true. Well, the reliable is true, but the infinitely fast is certainly not. So we need to be able to solve an infinite size graph problem in a constant amount of time. That's the challenge. Furthermore, interpreting logical measurements is, is far from clear. Here is state distillation. Um, Andrew Landau pointed out that there's a much better way of doing this, which I'll replace in future talks, which only requires two qubits, which was quite exciting. Here is the version as a braid. So it's been optimized and packed in space time so that it's efficient. But now the question is, well, what does it do? What is the output? There are all kinds of byproduct operators associated with this braiding. You know, a CNOT gate doesn't just do a CNOT. It also introduces correlated byproduct operators, XX, XZ, and all, all sorts of combinations. And you need to know how to interpret the measurements around those braids to work out what those byproduct operators are. Furthermore, I could execute this in this direction in time, this direction in time, this direction in time, and suddenly what used to be an initialization, so this U shape when executed in this direction is, a, is an initialization, can be some, something quite different. And it's no longer clear how you would transform the byproduct operators as you rotate this and deform this in space and time. We won't be talking any further about this particular classical processing challenge. Instead, we'll be pro, uh, presenting a solution to this challenge. So, Correcting errors fast enough. You can't do it infinitely fast. You've got to be fast enough, though. So let's consider the life cycle of an error. We have this circuit. So here's our error correction circuit. And this is a blow up of it, again, in space and time. And then on the way, one of our check qubits, one of our syndrome qubits, suffers a bit flip error. Now, if you trace through all these gates, just imagine exploding it out of the page in time, you'd get this these X errors propagate by virtue of CNOTs until they're eventually detected by our Z basis measurements, these guys. So this X error propagates to these two space-time locations. Now, given a series of error models, so an error model for all of our gates, we can work out the probability that that particular error is created and the probability that you observe this particular pair of detection events. We can also then do that for all possible errors for all possible gates. And what you will get with is something that looks like this. So this connection from here to here is represented, if you can see it, quite faintly by this diagonal line down there. And for that matter, this one here and this one here. 
So this particular picture we call a lattice. We call it a lattice just to distinguish between the graph that we'll see later that is part of the matching problem. And it represents the probability that any given pair of syndrome locations are connected by single qubit errors. It's a very useful object. It allows us to take into account uh, any error model and feed that information into the matching problem such that it makes very good guesses about which errors are connected. So for example, let's take an arbitrary example. You have an error right here. You'll see this great big fat cylinder which is the probability of a connection to the time boundary. If you like, that's the probability that the first and second measurements differ. Let's imagine there's another detection event here, and you'll see there's this very faint diagonal line. It would be much more reasonable to match the error in this corner to the boundary than it would be to match it to syndrome change. So that's the basic idea. And when you do all of these reasonable guesses, you find the error correction performs a lot better. So, how do you do it in a bit more detail? So we have this underlying lattice which characterizes our error models for all of our gates. We then go and run our simulation. We generate detection events in space and time. And then we essentially solve the minimum weight perfect matching theorem on these two objects. So we have a graph that has no edges. These are our vertices. And an underlying lattice that allows us to calculate the weight of an edge between any pair of vertices. So here, as I say, we have a lattice. We call it a lattice of dots and lines. It's just terminology. Um, we take the weight of the line to be the minus log of its probability. Naively, this means that the higher the probability of error, the lower the weight, all right? And the more likely we'll choose it when we do minimum weight perfect matching. And here's an example of a minimum weight perfect watch matching using that actual object. This if you then go and correct your classical measurements, and it should be stressed that the whole procedure is all about fixing up classical measurements. You never go back to your quantum system and actually do anything. This process of fixing those classical measurements is highly likely to preserve your logical state. So, how is minimum weight perfect matching done? It's a very old and well-studied algorithm. It was invented by a guy, Jack Edmonds, way back in 1965. So, Despite the fact that it's been well studied, it's been well studied in the context of here is an arbitrary graph with arbitrary weights and edges, and let's solve that case. So when you do that, it's a really tough problem. So given n vertices, it takes order n cubed time. The available library functions are out on the web, they don't support continuous processing. After all, you keep generating more and more data. So not only do you have an infinite matching problem in space, you have an infinite matching problem in time. So it doesn't support any of that. It doesn't support parallel processing. And when you actually run it, it's quite slow. So we've been running it for some years, and this was the best we could do with the available Kolmogorov code. We could get up to distance nine and get reasonable st statistics. Reasonable t statistics means uh, 10,000 logical failures. So every one of these data points represents a repetition of error correction until we observe a failure and we do that 10,000 times. Um, I'd like to point out one somewhat embarrassing feature of this particular graph. Uh, we worked quite hard to even just to get this distance nine with the library code. Working quite hard mean we worked a lot of computers quite hard to get this graph. Um, and we thought, looking at this data, that it was fairly reasonable to conclude that error rate was 1.1%. It turns out that's wrong. There are all kinds of boundary effects at work. Um, in particular, if you have a look back here at the lattice, you'll notice that you're much more likely to match a detected error here to the boundary. These boundary stabilizers have weight three. They're more reliable. They involve fewer gates. They increase the power of your error correction. So when you have a small code with a lot of boundary, it performs better than a large code which effectively has no boundary. So while it seemed reasonable at the time to conclude that the threshold error rate was 1.1%, we'll actually see the threshold error rate is 0.9% in our large scale simulations. And that was quite surprising to us since we thought we had reasonably good error suppression at 0.9%. We'll see how that changes a bit later in the story. So, the algorithm without two. 
So this is our fundamental simulated system. We take a 2D patch of qubits, all of these are data, all these are syndrome, here are our logical operators. We simulate the circuits with initialization errors, two qubit C not gate errors, you know, measurement errors, all the usual stuff, depolarizing channel. We perform a full error analysis, create this lattice, and then we perform in a way matching. But we perform it in a very specific manner. And to describe that, let's not talk about this 3D object, which would be a nightmare. Let's instead break this underlying lattice, describing our problem, into a simple 2D nearest neighbor lattice. So these little gray lines represent equal weight links. Our dots represent our detection events, so the endpoints of error chains. And then we have a few other objects. So time's going up. You can imagine this is a 1D approximation of our 2D surface code purely for explanation purposes. These pictures should not be confused with our actual algorithm. They're a cartoon of how the algorithm works. And we have a whole bunch of other things. So we have a cutoff line here, which represents the uh, fact that you can't create this lattice. You can see how it's kind of all broken at the top. You can't create this lattice before you have a few rounds of error correction. In practice, the, the number is two. Um, so you can't do any matching up here. You don't have full error information yet. And then there's this dotted line, which actually doesn't exist now in our simulations. Here it just represents the latest vertex we've successfully matched. And then you sort of have this little void where it should be possible to match some of these vertices by now. We have enough data. They're far enough back in the past, singing our classical computer. We should be able to work out how to uh, fix them by now. So here it is. What do we do? Well, we pick a vertex. From there, we go and explore the local region. So it's a breadth first search, and we stop searching when we encounter other objects. So those other objects may be other explored space, they may be other unmatched vertices. If we encounter other unmatched vertices, then we're happy because we can just go and match to one of them. And we're done with that pair for the moment. It should be stressed that this matching is not forever, nor are these matchings forever. I've seen a lot of attempts to generate uh, efficient heuristics for minimum weight matching, and they never take into account the fact that a given matched pair can change as the algorithm proceeds. Yep, no problem. All right, so then we pick another vertex explore the space time region around it till we encounter other objects. And here we need to do something different because this vertex is already matched. What we do is we create what's called an alternating tree. Now a tree is a simple object. It's a graph that has just a unique path from the root to every leaf. The only difference between a tree and an alternating tree is it comprises of alternating unmatched and matched edges. So with that definition in mind, you can also define what's called outer vertices, which you can think of as every second vertex from the root. So this is an outer vertex, and this is an outer vertex. They're numbered, and we'll keep that convention as we go. We would like to expand the exploratory region around every outer vertex and decrease the exploratory uh, region around every inner vertex. You kind of get this growing bubbles and shrinking bubbles such that all the bubbles just touch the edges. But in this particular case, they're already touching. We can't expand it further. So what we actually do is we coalesce this into a single object. So this is now an alternating tree with just one node. And we call that a blossom. It's just terminology. So this one node is then expanded. We expand further out there, again, until we encounter interesting objects nearby. Here we've encountered a boundary and an unmatched vertex. So we have a couple of choices as to what to do next. The easiest choice is easy and say, oh, there's an unmatched vertex. Let's just match with that. And in practice, that is what you do. A, a little bit more um, complicated choice, which is illustrative, you could instead choose to match this vertex, which was the unmatched one, to the boundary. And that means that we, you would change this unmatched edge to matched, this matched one to unmatched, and this one to matched. So it's an example of how the matching can change dynamically as you add more data. M new data can tell you, hey, that matching you did way back in the past, that was wrong. This is a better way of doing it. We keep going, choose another vertex, form an alternating tree, expand the outer exploratory regions at the cost of the inner one, try to keep going, we can't, form a blossom, we now have a single node alternating tree, form a new alternating tree, so this has a blossom as its first outer node, a huge blossom as its second inner node, and then a single vertex, uh, still matched, as its second 
outer node. We then again expand the outer at the cost of the inner. And what you find is we've now entered the forbidden region. So this is the broken up region where our lattice has not yet had time to keep track of all the errors. When we do that, we know we're doing the wrong thing. And so we abort. We abort by undoing. So you run the algorithm backwards until you get back to the beginning of that matching. And you stop. You stop until your quantum computer generates more data, and then you start trying to do matching again. So if we had one more row of data up here, I'd be able to move this forbidden line up one, and that previous attempt at matching would have succeeded, and we could have continued over here, we would have been able to easy match this one to the boundary, we would have been able to do this one, we would have been able to match that one to here, and so on. So it gradually percolates up. As you layer more and more data on to the matching problem, you can match more and more data in the past. So what are the feet of this algorithm? There are many rules, but each rule is simple and cheap. So while it's a very complicated algorithm to write, it runs very quickly. On average, every vertex only needs local information, which is a very important property. Now, that's only a property of the graphs generated by a quantum computer running topological error correction. Because the graphs correspond to the endpoints of error chains, and the probability of having a weight n error chain goes as naively, the physical probability p to the n. So they're exponentially suppressed. If you have fewer vertices, it takes less processing. Sounds silly, but you know it's an important feature. The, the more reliable the quantum computer is, the faster the algorithm runs. It's also important to note that it remains efficient even at an above threshold error rate. So I purposely constructed the example to be pretty much at the threshold error rate for this example. So this example is a 2D nearest neighbor. Threshold error rate is around 10%. Approximately 10% of the nodes here which have detection events. And you could see that there were no problems. Everything was still local. It still worked just fine. You can even go up to you know, 4 or 5% physical gate error, and the algorithm will still run quite well. Um, it's not a problem. So the threshold error rate is a very interesting quantity in these uh, things. It's, you know, what exactly is it that makes error correction break when you hit the threshold error rate? So because you only need a local amount of information on average per vertex with exponentially small probability, you might need the entire graph just to successfully match one vertex. But the average is constant. Because of that, it takes order n time, where n is the number of vertices per round of error correction. If you make uh, that the, the size of the lattice, then it would go order d squared. So the area determines how many vertices you have. Note also that the runtime is independent of how much history you have. So if this extended down, you know, it's in the past, we, we didn't use anything down below here. And so we have a few uh, checks that go into determining when we can discard old information. Past a certain pro uh, point, the probability of needing that uh, old data is much, much lower than the probability of having a logical error. And since that's OK, you can introduce a new error that's smaller than the probability of a logical error. You just throw that data away. So it only requires finite memory. Furthermore, if you just imagine doing a, a double size uh, example, imagine putting another one of these panels over here, there would be nothing wrong with one of these guys being handled one, with one processor and one of the, on this by another. It's parallelizable in a very natural way. You have to take into account communication between the two processes. So if you have errors near the boundary and you start constructing exploratory regions around here, we plan to make a, a given active exploratory region a forbidden region. So if a competing expands an alternating tree into another active process's alternating tree, we would abort and undo and then make that one static. For example, anyway, you can solve the communication and conflict resource problems efficiently. The main point is that even when you do this, you still only require local information. So you can have an infinite size lattice with constant computing error resources per unit area, fixed size patches independent of the strength of the error correction code. So these don't need to grow more expensive as the code gets bigger. And solve the whole infinite problem, get the global minimum weight optimal matching in order one time. Our current implementation, however, is only single processor. So let, yep, you, okay, nearly there. So this is what you get when you actually run the numbers. You have a physical error rate for your gates, a logical error rate, and you can see that you get all of these curves which, when you stare very hard at this and blow it up, give you a new threshold error rate at 
0.9% different to our old work, which was 1.1%. What did not change, however, is these numbers. So at an error rate of half percent, you get a factor of two suppression of logical error as you increase the size of the code. At an error rate of 0.2%, you get a factor of 10. So these are very practical, high error rates leading to very practical suppressions in error. Things that limit us going further are really just memory, so we need to get on with parallelizing the code, and we'll do that uh, starting from next Monday. So, just to summarize, so we presented a complexity optimal algorithm. You can't do better in terms of complexity. It takes order n squared time in serial, where n is the linear dimension of your lattice. You can parallelize it to order one. So we can accurately handle an arbitrary error model on each gate that generates these guys. And it's sufficiently fast at this error rate for many architectures. However, we want to take it, we want to reduce the memory usage, improve its speed, and raise the practical P, because we certainly don't want our classical processor to limit the speed of our quantum processor or our classical processing capability to tell us what the compu computationally efficient threshold error rate is. We want to actually get the theoretical threshold error rate out of our code. So hopefully a year from now, all of that will imp be implemented. And thank you for your attention. We have time for a few questions. You said uh, that when you perform the matching, uh, you will not act on uh, the last two rounds uh, of uh, the syndrome measurements. Why the last two rounds? Why not five? And would that depend on uh, the error model you're using? Yeah, it does. It, it also depends a little bit on what you define a round to be. So we defined a round to be to be as long as it takes for syndrome to be measured. If you have a model that involves qubit loss or gates that can fail, it can take an unequal amount of time for every syndrome to be measured. So it's two layers of every syndrome being measured. Why? Because two layers of error correction are guaranteed to catch every single error. All right? A single error in one layer can, if it's lucky, propagate through one layer, but not two. So after you've done two rounds, you know what's going to happen. Nothing more, more will change. Um, so I wonder whether this 1.1% earlier, earlier threshold result still stands or not. No. You, you said no because it was just boundary effects. But if I yeah. now look at your plot, those curves all meet at one point, starting from a 3 by 3 surface. Yeah, yeah, it looked pretty reasonable to us at the time. So um, what goes wrong? Mm -hmm. So you're getting a lot of help from the boundaries. They're boosting up the power of your error correction. And that goes away when you go to larger error rates. So while at small distances and higher error rates, you see benefit as you go to a larger distance because you're getting more of these lovely boundary positions, as it gets bigger and bigger, eventually your code's not getting help from these boundaries. And what you'll see is this logical error rate goes up and up and up and up. I mean, uh, sorry, the logical reliability goes up and up and up. And then past a certain point, it starts to come back down and eventually plummets. OK, but I just I want to point at your new curve. So sure. please uh, just uh, go forward. Um, yeah, so the new this data? Curve, yeah, they all intersect in one point. You don't seem to have any boundary effects there. They all. This is at large lattice sizes. So this is at distance 25, 35, 45, 55. But look, it's, uh, in, the, in, the, in the big plot, it's, the it big starts plot, at the equals 3. And they go, all go through one point. Yeah. So no boundary effects there. They all go through one point here because I've chopped off all of the lower distance information. The lower distance stuff is all over the place. All right. So eventually, at high enough distances, you get rid of the boundary effects, and things are nice. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we can, we can talk about it more. There were a couple more questions. Question about the instantaneous gradient. Yes. So I suspect that you will get lots of entropy for the errors if you try to get this instantaneous because you have created suddenly lots and lots of boundary. And so the errors will sort of, you know, you will need lots of space around it to protect if you try to do it instantaneously. So you may be better off moving this slowly. Okay, so it's, it's a fair question, but it, it's actually not a problem. So when you want to create a long defect, effectively move it, you just turn off a few CNOT gates. So it's not a violence in your computer. That process 
uh, uh, turns weight four stabilizers into weight three stabilizers. All right, so it's a very gentle effect on your computer. You don't upset it. You only then need the standard distance to protect the code. So yeah, sure, you need a protective region around all those defects, but you need a protective region around all defects, and it's the same amount of protective region. Okay. It's not a violent operation. Yep. Uh, just a quick clarification on language. When you say boundary effects, do you really mean finite size effects? If you I mean run the this fact on a that you have weight three stabilizers that are more reliable and give you better, more reliable error information. If you had put it on a torus, for example, would you that expect to there. see the same effect? No, that has I, no boundary. It's, it's one reason we, people that have stu studied uh, toric <laughs> boundary conditions have much cleaner plots than we do. So you think it w these issues would go away if you were on Absolutely. a torus? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of published literature. Roberts uh, numerics, for example, they have boundary conditions that are are periodic and they don't have any of these effects. Okay. Let's take one more question. David, would you mind setting up your talk in the meantime? <coughs> so my question was essentially the same, but just to follow on, can you tell me why you, you didn't, what, was there a reason that you didn't, didn't impose periodic boundary conditions? Why we didn't use periodic boundary mm -hmm. conditions? Because we're writing software to uh, interface with the experiment. So we want it to be, I mean, it's hard to handle boundaries, okay? We had to go to a lot of effort to handle the boundaries. And we went to that effort so we can run it on an experiment one day. Okay, let's thank Austin again. Uh, yeah, you need